All right. Good morning, everyone. Today is Tuesday, October 6th. And we're going to push ahead. Um, as I told you, day one, we start out slow and the momentum builds. So today I might go a little bit faster. Let me know if that volume is, is too, too high or too low. It's hard for me to tell. Um, all right. I think we left off last week um, talking about uh, orange juice and sugar. Today I have some other uh, contracts that we'll look at very briefly, not in as much detail. But I think our discussion uh, last Thursday was great in terms of the un understanding how the orange juice contract works. Um, this slide is, is hard to read, but I've got the link here for you, finviz.com. And it shows the relative performance uh, so far in 2015 of various futures contracts. And you'll see there's a lot of numbers that are in the red. So the big uh, theme this quarter is that commodity prices have been falling. And we've connected that to you know, events such as uh, US uh, fracking, uh, slowdown in economic growth, in China, uh, etc. So there's a lot of red here. And down at the bottom, we see um, commodities such as coffee. Coffee's down 20, or excuse me, 32 percent this year. Um, wheat is down 21 percent. Heating oil is down 15 percent. Soybeans down 10 percent, and so on. The one up top, the big positive number, is called the, the VIX, and I'll talk about the VIX uh, later on today. That's a volatility index, and it's based on um, the stock market, and it's based on um, the price of stock options. Uh, the, the stock market uh, has been quite volatile this year. Uh, really started with the collapse of the Chinese stock market back in June. So there is a futures contract that's based on volatility in the stock market, and that's called the VIX. Here's a, a more recent chart that's a little bit easier to read. And this shows, um, this is from The Economist magazine, and it shows the performance of Basically, uh, some of the same commodities. And we see, actually, tea has increased in price this year. Um, I think there was a, a problem with the crop in one, a part of the world. It might have been Africa. I can't remember. Uh, but except for tea, maize, which is corn, and Australian wool, um, and a little bump in wheat, a lot of negative uh, price changes. Okay? Orange juice is down big time. Cotton is down big time as is Brent crude. So that's our theme, falling commodity prices. Some years, it's rising commodity prices. It's the way the world works. All right. Um, this quarter, I will spend quite a bit of time talking about the crude oil market. And we'll use it um, in many of the examples on the quizzes and the the midterms. So this is a chart showing the price of, uh, it's called historical crude oil front month futures prices. And what does that mean? What does a front month mean? Well, you know that in the case of crude oil, um, there are a lot of different contracts traded uh, for several years into the future. So the front month is the nearest contract. It's the one that's closest to expiry. So if we keep track of those price changes, and then if a contract expires, we just pick up the next one, the next nearest one. So that's the front month price. And we see we have two lines here, the WTI crude oil in the blue. And that stands for West Texas Intermediate Crude, um, which is a, a light sweet crude oil traded in the United States. Uh, it's the benchmark crude oil price for oil transactions in the US and other parts of the world. 
bless you. And then we have the Brent crude price. Brent crude price is the, the orange line. And you see that uh, early in the year, the two prices were very similar. That was true last fall as well. They came apart a little bit, back together, and now there's a slight gap again. Brent crude, that's the price of oil in the North Sea. Um, you sort of between the, you know, the UK and Norway and Denmark up there. Um, that is a benchmark for spot trading in crude oil um, in many parts of the world. They say about two-thirds of the world crude oil uh, traded internationally trades off the Brent price. Uh, it's somewhat controversial because actually production in that part of the world in the North Sea is coming down. But nonetheless, it's still a very important market. Um, both of these uh, markets are, are quite similar. Um, we see that they're not perfectly arbitraged because the US um, price is inland. It's for delivery in Cushing, Oklahoma via pipeline. Uh, the Brent crude price is for delivery in the North Sea by vessel. So they're two different physical locations. The type of oil is quite similar. Um, probably the WTI has a slightly lower sulfur content. And actually, historically, the WTI used to trade at a premium to Brent. It's now gone to a discount. And there are a number of reasons for that, one being uh, US increased production. Right? Uh, we used to uh, import 60% of our oil. Now we import 40% of our oil because of fracking, increased US production. Uh, and the uh, US government has um, restriction on crude oil exports. Okay? Uh, and that goes back many, many years. Uh, so it's difficult for producers in the US to sell their oil onto the world market in crude form because the US wants to uh, maintain stability and uh, security of supply in the domestic market. So, um, both of these contracts trade in units of 1,000 barrels of oil. Um, and the, the main market for the WTI is uh, the New York market, which is now owned by the CME, the Commodity Mercantile Exchange. It's a deliverable contract. In other words, if you buy a WTI contract, you're promising to take delivery of 1,000 barrels of oil at an agreed upon price. And if you stand for delivery, you don't reverse your position. You wait till the, the delivery period. And the clearinghouse calls you and says, you know, we have your oil. Well, once again, if you look outside your bedroom window, you won't see a, a thousand barrels of oil. It's going to be in a pi pipeline in Oklahoma. That's where your oil is. Um, on, the, on the Brent side, as I said, it's delivery. Um, in a vessel. Uh, there are alternative oil futures contracts. For example, the ICE also has a WTI contract, and it's uh, cash settled. And uh, the NYMEX, which is the New York Exchange, also has a Brent crude price, and it happens to be uh, cash settled as well. But the main markets are uh, settled by delivery. So here's a map showing you the, the oil field in the North Sea to give you an idea of where the Brent, uh, what the Brent price refers to. Uh, and you see that there's, it's a, little, it's a little light, but there are a lot of oil fields. There's a lot of offshore drilling in that part of the world. Right? Um, I had the opportunity to visit Norway this summer. And uh, the last time I was there was a long time ago, um, probably before all of you were born. But uh, when I went there many, many years ago, it was kind of a poor country. People didn't have um, as much as we did in this country. When I went there this uh, summer, um, I've never seen so many Teslas in my life. Okay. So it, of course, I get envious when I see people driving around in a Tesla. Um, Norway is a very rich country today because of the oil, and uh, they they've managed their uh, oil reserves very well. But most of that oil is offshore.
it's interesting when you go into the the restaurants in Norway um, or any service sector. It was kind of annoying to my wife, but usually I was interviewing the staff to find out where they originated from, and I, I didn't meet one person working in the service industry who was Norwegian. Um, flew over to Norway on Air Norwegian. Nobody on the plane, working on the plane, was Norwegian. Right? Uh, this, they have too much money. They don't have to work on airplanes or work in restaurants. That's, they use foreign labor for that. Um, thanks to the price of oil, but guess what? Price of oil has come down, right? We saw in the previous chart, oh, let me just put it back up because I forgot to mention that, and some of you are well aware of this. You know, last summer the price, call it $100 a barrel, um, now it's below 50. Okay, does anybody know where WTI is today? Anybody? No? All right, 40 something, right? Close to 50 bucks. So the price of oil has dropped in half in the past year. So that's a lot of less revenue for countries like Norway or Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is actually borrowing money on the world market, the world financial markets. They're borrowing money. 46.22. Thanks, yeah. Saudi Arabia is borrowing money. Imagine that. Why? Because they have this uh, spending program that's a function of the price of oil a year ago, $100. And now it's 50. Um, this chart uh, is a little more complicated, and it's something that'll have more relevance later in the quarter, but I just want to introduce the concept today. So once again, we have uh, WTI and Brent, right? WTI is the blue, Brent's the orange. And this is the front month minus the 13th month futures price spread, okay? So Let's suppose uh, here, um, just for sake of argument, let's say that's November 15, which would be the front month, right? Minus the 13 month, so that would be D16. So it would be the nearby minus uh, the price 13 months from now. So that's a price spread. So this is a differential. You see the number's a lot lower. And um, we see that that number is now negative, right? This number here is about a minus $5 a barrel, which says that, uh, Yan, what did you say the nearby was $46? Yeah. All right, so if we went out to D16, it's probably $51. It's about $5 higher. And we call that a contango. I don't know if you've heard that word before, but you'll become very familiar with it over the next few weeks. So this is a contango. Contango means that the distant futures price is above the nearby price. That's a very important price spread for a number of reasons. Uh, one simple reason is it does signal whether there's a shortage or abundance in this market. And if we're in a contango, depending on the size of the contango, that usually indicates that uh, there's an abundance of the product. So oil is now in a contango. So I look at that and I think, well, we're not short of oil, Ben. Yeah, Ben's question is, why is it 13 months and not six months, or it's not 18 months? Well, you know, it's kind of arbitrary. Um, it, it does take some time. Let's say if there's, you know, the number of oil rigs in the United States have gone down recently. And so it could relate to, you know, how much time would it take for those rigs to start pumping again? It, it might take about one year. So, But, uh, you know, we can talk about this spread for any time difference. And if we're looking at, say, the corn market, we might talk about a three-month time period or a six-month time period. But it's fairly typical in oil to talk about a one-year time period. But this isn't saying that the oil market is unresponsive to the shortage of supply being The spread? Yeah, I mean, so the price of whatever barrel of oil. I mean, it just makes it seem like if oil is unresponsive in the short term, it means less than one year. 
Okay, um, so let's let's follow up on that. Um, so what this is saying is the uh, that this price is forty six dollars. That's what Ian told us, right? All right, that's close enough. Let's say that's fifty one. Um, so I'm not sure, I'm not clear on your question, Ben. Oh, supply, yeah. So the question is, because you're looking at a 12-month spread, basically, uh, oil's not that responsive. The production of oil is not that responsive, but we ha also have large stocks of oil, okay? So um, another way to interpret this spread is uh, to view it, bless you, as a price of inventories, as a price of storage. So if the spread's high, that's actually encouraging stock holding. Uh, because you can buy the spot, you, so you could buy spot oil for 46, you could sell the futures for 51 and earn five bucks on storage. Depending on what your storage costs are, that might be a good or bad deal. So, uh, yeah, but clearly, oil, like most commodities, uh, the production uh, is not as, as responsive to price as it might be for some other products, but. Um, you know, that's just the nature of commodities. It's true for agricultural commodities, too, because you have a planting and harvest period. Amir? Can I have a positive number? Does that mean, like, prior to 13 months, you'll have a number lower than your 36? So Amir's question is, because it's a positive number, does that mean that next year the price is going to be negative lower? It's a positive, because right now it's negative 5. Yeah, it's negative 5 because we're taking the... November minus the December, but it means that the December price next year is above the price today, right? So if, uh, if we plot the price today, it's, it's here. Uh, if we plot the, plot the price a year from now, it's higher, okay? So what does that mean? Well, uh, we'll get into that in great detail in this class. As I said, uh, one interpretation is, you know, that's what the market is paying uh, merchants to store oil. Another view is that this is really a forecast of the price of oil, okay? Um, so I was at a conference uh, last week um, with some um, mostly non-economists, and uh, they were looking at, you know, the natural gas market and its use in... Um, in terms of reducing carbon emissions. And there were a lot of statements made about uh, what's going to happen to the price of oil. And well, you know, it's going to go back up to $100 next year. And I, I just pulled out the, the Wall Street Journal, right? I mean, that's, that's what I go to. And according to the futures market, the price of oil next year is going to be $51. And if you think that's wrong, then you better just get up and walk out now because you can become very rich, right? So that's the best predictor that I know of for the price of oil next year, Amir. It may not be perfect. I mean, what are the odds that the price of oil next December is going to be 51? I don't know. You know, it's, you might say, well, it's only 5% or 10%. It's not huge. But I'm telling you, I don't know of any better estimate today as to what the price of oil is going to be a year from now, because that's what the market's telling us. That's what the market participants believe. And there's some large traders in this market. ExxonMobil, Chevron, you know, Pemex from Mexico, Saudi Arabia, Norway. And if they thought it was going to be $100, well, I guarantee the December 16 price wouldn't be 51 yen. So Jan's question is, why are there so many different classifications? Well, that's only two. Uh, so in the crude oil market, um, there are two benchmarks. And oil is produced in many parts of the world, right? So if you're producing oil in Africa, in Nigeria, it's got to be priced off of one of those benchmarks. If you're producing oil in Venezuela or Mexico, it's got to be priced off one of those benchmarks. So oil is a commodity. And as I defined a commodity last week as being a product um, that's highly substitutable. So uh, WTI is a sp 
particular type of oil that has a particular sulfur content. Um, so one barrel of WTI is exactly the same to an, as another barrel. The Brent is slightly different, but are they substitutable? Absolutely. Do you get the same exact products if you crack one barrel versus another? Not necessarily a little bit different. So. Why is there a difference in price? Well, I just explained um, th they're not perfectly arbitraged. Right? You can't export crude oil from the United States. And the price of WTI is in Cushing, Oklahoma. It's a different location. right? So it's supply and demand. Supply and demand in the North Sea versus supply and demand in the United States, continental United States. Okay. Yes? Okay, so your question is, are these prices estimates? Here? Okay, so what, what this says, in July 2014, okay, so that was over a year ago, those, those were the price spreads. Back then, this was a positive number. So back then, the market was in backwardation. Okay? It was a positive number because the nearby was higher than the 13 month. Yeah, it's, so your question is, is that an estimate? No. These price spreads, so it's a difference between two futures prices, was the actual spread on a given day. So in July 2014, if you looked at uh, WTI, which is the blue line, you see that it hit $10. So in July 2014, the nearby futures, which would have been probably August or September, was $10 above the futures for delivery thir 13 months later. At that point in time, and then these price spreads chart what's happened to that difference. The futures months will change because we're always doing a nearby, so that's going to roll. Do you understand? Or still not clear? So it's not an estimate, it's a market price. When you say left part, you mean the vertical axis? Yeah, that's, a, that's dollars per barrel price spread. Okay? It's front month minus 13th month. That's what it is. Okay? That's. So, um, your question is in October 14? They didn't hear? Okay. Uh, none of these prices are estimates. Okay. They're all market prices. So in October 14, what is that? Well, it's probably the November 14 minus the December 15. Yeah, that's past. Okay, so October 15, 14, excuse me, that spread would equal NOV 14 minus DIS 15 at that point in time, okay? As I mentioned the other day, um, sorry, what's your name? Ravine. Ravine. As I mentioned the other day, is it Ravine? Vivian. Vivian, okay. You're Vivian. You're the one that told me about the bookstore. Hey, by the way, um, they're going to give a refund. They're making a special exemption. So 
Has anyone tried to get a refund and been refused? Okay. Sorry, Vivian. Um, you're sitting in a different spot. So, yeah, okay. Um, so, we need to be clear on this. As I said last time, you know, if you pull out the Wall Street Journal, you're going to see that the crude oil futures market um, trades today for delivery six, seven, eight years into the future. Okay? We can find a price today for December uh, 2020, December 2017, and so on. There's all these contracts that are being traded. Each of these prices is a price spread. So it's the price difference between two different maturities that happen to mature about a year apart, 13 months apart. Okay? And each price is just a snapshot in time. So we, we checked what the spread was in July 14. We checked what the price was in October 14, and so on. Do you understand it now? Yeah. Okay. How about you over here, gentlemen? Okay, good. Thanks. I think uh, Ben had a question, okay? And then I'll come to you, Yosef. Yeah. Okay, Yosef. So uh, the day it passes, and you can take it off the spot price from that time, track the future contracts that are being traded. So if the date passes, then you roll on to the next futures, okay? So uh, let's, let's say this price, uh, it's now October, right? So let's say we're over here. So we're now using uh, knob 15 versus D16. Probably on October 15th, we're going to flip from November 15 to December 15. So on October 15th, we'll, we'll rotate. We'll go up to uh, November 16, uh, 15, ex excuse me, December 16 for the nearby and January 17 for the distance. So once a month, we're going to change those contracts. Does that answer your question? OK, yeah. All right. So uh, Jan's um, wondering, why do they have to do it this way? Why can't they just? Write down the price. Um, OK, so you just have to be patient with me, all right? Uh, by the end of this quarter, probably the next four or five weeks, you're going to understand why this is extremely important, OK? Uh, so if you're a crude oil trader, if you're working for JP Morgan or Exxon or Chevron, this is your bread and butter. You have to understand these price spreads. So in the futures market, not only is the absolute price important, but the price spread is also important. The market was in backwardation a year ago. Now it's in contango. Okay? That's useful information. So it's important because the sign and the size of this spread uh, will affect how much oil is put into inventories. And oil going into inventories is oil that we can use in future months. Amir. So I was just looking online for last year. So let's say for July 14th, um, the price of oil for uh, the UCI, I think August 14th, is about 20 bucks a barrel. Yeah. Fifty. Call it fifty. Yeah. Yeah. Why do we have this ten then? Okay. The ten is the spread between two different oil contracts. Okay. What you're telling me is this: what we saw here. Okay. That's just the price of one contract, the nearby contract. Okay. So you can think of this. It, that says the front month. So here we just track the front month, and every month we roll it. Okay. Like I explained to Yusef. The next one, we're plotting the difference between two. So yes, it was $100, but the difference between the nearby and the 13 month was 10. So that would have been 190. Okay. 
yeah, if you buy at 90 and sell at 45, you can say you lost your shirt. Was there a question over here? No, all right. That's good. It means the guys are thinking ahead and um, we, you know, there's almost an entire chapter on, on um, the importance of uh, contango versus backwardation. And obviously this is important for storable commodities. Yes, there's a question in the back. So your question was at ETF, so an exchange traded futures, tracking commodities with a contango, yeah. So they have to roll, is that what you're asking me? Yeah. yeah, if the market's in contango, so they have to, let's say they have to get out of the nearby and then buy into a higher price. So yes, they're gonna have to sell, let's say at 50, and they're gonna have to buy in at 55. So absolutely, it could affect the, the return. And so that's another reason why backwardation or contango is important, because if you have an ETF, um, which tracks the price of oil. I assume that's what you're talking about, right? Um, the performance over a given year is gonna be partly a function of what happens to the price of oil, but also whether it's in backwardation or contango. Okay. All right. Um, we talked about falling commodity prices and um, the fact that China had something to do with this. So I just thought I'd show you uh, this chart, which shows China's consumption of key commodities. Okay, so first of all, China is officially the second largest economy in the world. If you use a different exchange rate, some people say it's the largest, but we can say it's the second largest. And this shows China's consumption of key commodities. So last week, I came up with a list of countries um, that were major exporters of commodities, right? We talked about uh, Canada, we talked about Brazil, we talked about Australia. So here's a major importer. So um, the blue line, excuse me, the black line is the early 1990s, and the red line you know, is, is 2010, so 20 years later, basically. So China's consumption of key commodities, primary energy, it's gone from 9% to 22% of world consumption. China consumes 11% of the world's oil. China is a net importer of oil. That's why one reason the price of oil is down is a slowdown in economic growth in China, less demand for oil. China consumes 44% of the world's metals, okay? 22% uh, of the world's grains, 20% um, of the world's edible oils, such as soybean oil. It has 19% of the population, 10% of the GDP, and 20% of industrial production. So it's a very big player in the commodities market. So when we talk about the commodities market, we can't help but talking about China. We saw the price of iron ore. Price of iron ore fell from what to what? Does anybody remember? It was over $100, right? Now it's down to 40. And who's disappointed in that? West Australia, Brazil, right? We said Brazil bet the farm on the price of iron ore. Well, China consumes 44% of the metals in the globe. So why is there so much focus <coughs> on China? Well, I'll show you another chart in a few seconds. 
Um, here's a, another important commodity, corn. Corn is the largest uh, cereal grain produced in the United States, and corn trades for uh, the following months, March, May, uh, July, September, and December. Turns out China is a pretty major importer of corn. They were buying a lot of corn from the United States until a couple of years ago, and now they buy most of their corn from the Ukraine. So corn's traded in the Chicago market, now owned by the CME. Um, we'll see that the price of corn, like a lot of commodities, has fallen. It's now somewhere between $3 and $4 a bushel. So the contract is 5,000 bushels. And this is cents per bushel, so it's about $3 per bushel. We see that it was really high in 2012. Anybody remember what happened in 2012 in the United States? You just have to look outside. We had the largest drought in the Midwest in several decades. The corn crop dropped by about one third. So when the corn crop fell by a third in the United States, being the world's largest exporter of corn, the price of corn went from $4 to $8. It doubled. Okay? So you talk about demand response. What do we use corn for? It's primarily used as animal feed. So if you have a um, feedlot full of livestock and the price of corn goes from 4 to $8, you have to continue feeding your livestock, right? So you just pay the $8. A third of our corn production in the U.S., and we do produce a lot of corn. It's about 12 billion bushels. A third of the crop, call it 4 billion bushels, we use for corn ethanol. It's motor fuel we put in our cars. Okay? And why do we do that? Well, the corn farmers have a very strong presence in Washington, D.C. They kept going to Washington, D.C. and asking Congress to require that a certain percentage of our motor fuel be made from corn. And finally, they found a sympathetic ear when George W. Bush was in office, and uh, he said, okay, that's fine. So we have mandates. So uh, when you go to the gas station here, you don't have a choice whether you want to buy ethanol or not. It's mandatory. Okay? If, I, if I buy motor fuel in Vancouver, Canada, I can go to the pump and I can choose. If I go to Brazil, I can choose. In the U.S., you don't have a choice. It's 10% ethanol. Uh, the argument was that somehow this was a good idea because it reduced our dependence on imported oil, but the truth of the matter is it takes almost a gallon of energy to produce a gallon of corn ethanol. It's not a very efficient way to produce energy from feedstock, and it turns out that it's not necessarily good for the environment either. So it's just one of those stories um, that makes you wonder how... Congress works. But that's the story of our corn market. Two-thirds animal feed, approximately one-third fuel. Um, the price is down here because we have large inventories. Okay? Um, half of the world's corn inventories are held by China. And China is now a net importer of corn. Okay? They're sitting on very large stocks of corn. Janet will put this chart up on the smart site. And um, it um, helps illustrate why there's so much focus on China. So this chart comes from The Economist magazine. And it shows uh, world uh, GDP, okay? world economic growth. And it shows China, which is this light blue bar, United States, which is a sort of a darker blue, 
India, which is a green kind of, and I don't know what that color is, but what's that color, Vivian, this top one? Is it brown? What? Yeah. OK. All right. I don't know what you said, but mauve? OK, the mauve. All right. Other countries are mauve. So what do you notice here? Um, you notice when you look at the, at the growth rate right now, globally, it's between 2 and 3%, right? So we're concerned about the trend here. That's why Janet Yellen backed off on her statements. So that's about 2.7% uh, world economic growth. Um, China is more than one, right? It's about 1.2. And U.S. looks like about um, as a share. U.S. looks like it's a little bit bigger, isn't it? I'll say 0.55, and uh, I'll say that this is 0.45, something like that. You take these three countries. The United States, India, and China account for 80%, 80 percent of world economic growth. Okay. So why do we pay a lot of attention when the president of China was visiting a few weeks ago? The president of uh, Prime Minister of India. Okay. Um, these three countries explain much of the world's growth. Okay. Um, 1.2 out of 2.7, what is that? About 40% of the world's economic growth is attributed to China. So if China slows down, if India slows down, you know, it's, we're going to start losing altitude, right? So this world airplane is kind of, well, I think one engine is out, right? Brazil went out, Russia went out. So if we had four engines, we're down to three. China, India, United States. If the China engine starts to sputter, one trouble. Yeah. You mean the move? Okay. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I just told you that's the fourth engine, right? Oh, okay. the, yeah. The, the we have four engines, right? One, two, three, four. This engine has gone out essentially, and that would be. Emerging economies, Brazil, Russia, okay, and so on. So the chart showing China's share of consumption of commodities, and this chart showing the importance of China in terms of world economic growth, I kind of rest my case that we have to pay a lot of attention, and that's what Janet Yellen is doing to what's happening in China. And you know that, that Yan said this growth is pretty steady in China. That's true. It's down now. It used to be double digit. Now it's whatever it is, 7% or something. It's coming down because a lot of that double digit growth was driven by exports and investment. And now China is trying to push more towards uh, growth as a function of domestic consumption. As I said, the savings rate is very high in China. So another set of markets that um, are extremely important. And I mentioned the largest financial market in the world would be currency markets, exchange rates. So we've talked about Brazil. There's a lot of news lately 
about the decline of the Brazilian economy, right? So this is a chart showing the Brazilian exchange rate, the real. There's a futures contract on the real. We've read about the decline in the Brazilian stock market. It's down 30, 40%. Uh, economic growth has turned negative, um, et cetera, et cetera. The currency has plunged. So when we look at the price of a currency futures, it's always quoted as dollars per foreign currency. Okay. <coughs> so the chart shows dollars per real. Okay. So up here, the price was about uh, 0.4. 40 cents per real. Down here, it looks like it got down to about 0.24, 24 cents per real. Okay. If we take the inverse of that, 1 over 0.4 would be 2.5 uh, uh, Brazilian real to the dollar. And if we take 1 over 0.24, Okay, that should give us about uh, 4.2 reals to the dollar. So when we work with currencies, you want to practice this a little bit before the, the quiz. Um, you might be familiar with, excuse me, currencies being quoted in terms of the foreign currency per U.S. dollar. But um, just as a heads up, when we're working with the futures market, it's always dollars per foreign currency. And we'll go through more examples of this. I'll, I'll talk about the Japanese yen and the European euro. This chart looks pretty familiar no matter what currency we look at. The US dollar is very strong right now. Strong not only relative to the Brazilian real, but you know the Japanese yen, the European euro, the Canadian dollar, the Australian dollar, so on and so forth. Okay. Um, so this chart says Brazilian airline goal, GOL, Brazilian airline earns revenue in real, but fuel costs are in dollars. So remember I told you that most of these commodities that we're discussing are traded in US dollars. It's true for iron ore or orange juice. Certainly true for oil. So you have these foreign airlines. For a typical airline, the biggest item in their cost is fuel. And they have to pay for fuel in US dollars, but they sell their tickets and earn the revenue in the local currency. So even though the price of oil might not change, the price that they're paying in the local currency could change dramatically. Okay? So back here, what it was 2.5 reals per dollar, um, they multiply that by the price of oil, okay, and that's their cost. Now it's 4.2 times the price of oil, and that's their cost. So it's true the price of oil over the past year has gone from, from $100 to $50. That's been really helpful to a U.S. airline because a U.S. airline sells tickets in dollars and they're fuels in dollars. It's not true for an airline from a foreign country like this because their cost in the local currency, if we hold the price of oil constant, has gone up about 30 percent. The same is true for, let's say, an airline from Australia. The Australian dollar has gone down over 30 percent. Qantas Airlines fly back and forth between Sydney and Los Angeles, Sydney, San Francisco. You imagine pulling out your credit card to fill up the jumbo jet in San Francisco, right? Um, cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And you've got to pay in dollars. But all their tickets are in Australian dollars. So we'll talk about 
how currencies affect revenue and costs for firms. And they, they could be you know, local firms. So there's a local airline in Canada that flies around. It's called WestJet. It's like Southwest. They don't travel outside the country that much, but still their bottom line is dramatically affected by the exchange rate, Canadian dollar versus US dollar, because the Canadian dollar has fallen over 20%, so their fuel costs have gone up 20% if we don't change the price of oil. Okay, a gentleman in the back was talking about um, ETFs, exchange traded funds. Um, that might be tied to commodities. Uh, when commodities rose in price back in 2007, 2008, there was um, a lot of excitement about this boom in commodity prices, and there was a lot of discussion about commodities being a new asset class, and basically there was a lot of money that flowed into commodities. And that general time period is called the financialization of the commodity sector. A lot of banks and uh, hedge funds discovered commodities, right? They didn't know much about them. Um, they, many of those people had never taken a course like this. They knew very little about the commodities market, but then they saw the price of corn going up. They saw the price of copper going up, price of of uh, wheat going up, and they decided they wanted part of that game. So they started investing in these commodities through ETFs or other sources. So this chart shows us the uh, assets under management in commodities. So this would be under professional managers. And you see there was quite an increase between, um, let's say, 2006, before this boom started. Uh, it, it sort of doubled. Okay. And most of this was in energy and in agriculture. Okay. And I remember here in 2008, when oil hit $150 per barrel, um, and that's when I, I mentioned to you this guy from Texas, T. Boone Pickens, who said oil's going to $200 a barrel. And a term that was being thrown around in those days was something called peak oil. Peak oil. So the story in those days was, oh, we're running out of oil. You know, oil's going to $200, maybe $250. Uh, it's never going back down again. Well, take a deep breath. Nobody's talking about peak oil today, are they? Um, because of fracking, largely because of fracking. But back in that time period when we had the so-called financialization of commodities, uh, we had congressional hearings into the price of oil. You know, Congress held hearings. Why is the price of oil so high? Why is it $150? And as T. Boone Pickens right, it's going to $200. This is, you know, damaging to our economy. Um, people can't afford to fill up their cars with petrol just to commute to work. Well, there was a lot of finger pointing towards the futures market, speculation, financialization. And they were, you know, there were some people who appeared before Congress and argued at the time. Personally, I didn't buy any of these arguments. But there were uh, individuals with some credibility who went to Congress and said, well, the reason oil has gone from $100 to $150 is because of speculation. It's the financialization. It's all this outside money coming into the oil market. So it's um, investors in Singapore or New York or Los Angeles that um, are wealthy individuals. Um, you know, they have no business trading in the oil market, and that's what's driving up the price. Well, it was, it was pretty short-lived. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about the so-called financialization and then definancialization of the commodities market. So related to the price of oil is the price of natural gas. Or as the traders say, nat gas. Okay? So here's a, a chart 
on the left hand side showing uh, the price of nat gas in millions of BTU and the price today Yan will correct me if I'm wrong but I think it's a, about two what is it okay um, you know having the internet in the classroom makes a job being professor more difficult right because I used to be able to say things facts and figures and nobody could check but now I have to be careful, because Yan's going to correct me if I'm wrong. But I'll say it's around $2.80 a million BTU, something like that. Question? Uh, British thermal unit. It's a measure of energy, the energy content. OK. So um, natural gas prices, like oil, have come down right, significantly. Um, this is the, the price of. The U.S. has come down from $12 to, to less than 3 And uh, there's a couple reasons for that. One is uh, it does compete with oil at some level, right? Natural gas is used primarily for um, production of electricity, uh, for heating. And we also have uh, some use of natural gas in vehicles, right? These red buses that are running around campus uh, are driven by compressed natural gas. You got it? Okay, well, it could be. Um, pardon? I don't know. It, it you know it doesn't matter whether it's two point five or two point eight. It's 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 down. Um, so why has natural gas come down? Well, look at this. Look at this um, increase production. Now, one interesting thing about the natural gas market is I told you that um, there's less than perfect arbitrage between the WTI and the Brent crude oil market, right? Um, but, but there is some. Um, but with natural gas, there's very poor arbitrage globally. So this is a chart showing the price of natural gas in the United States. So Yan tells us it's 2.5, something like that. This is Europe, where it's, you know, whatever it is, uh, $8. And Japan, it's around $9. Uh, these came down from like $17, something like that. Um, so this, this could be a different location than the previous chart. It depends, obviously, where you measure the price. But the important message with this chart is that um, starting, you know, with sort of at the end of the financial crisis, the, the price spiked, all three lines spiked during that period that I talked about a second ago, during the commodity boom, right? All three prices spiked. And then they started coming down. The US price came down more than world prices and stayed much lower. Well, why is that? For the simple reason that um, the US is a large producer of natural gas, but it's very difficult to export natural gas unless it's liquefied, OK? Unless it's liquefied. And we don't really have um, the facilities to export a lot of our natural gas. And I'll talk about that in a second. So I read The Economist magazine. And every year, they send me this little booklet right? that has uh, facts and figures related to the global economy. So it's, I like having this book in my briefcase. So here's a section on natural gas. So I can give you a quiz. So it says the top 10 producers in the world. So who do you suppose the largest producer of natural gas in the world is? No. US. Number two, Russia. Number three, Qatar. Top producer, United States. Number two, Russia. Top consumers. U.S., number two. 
Russia. Is that a big surprise? Can't trade this stuff, right? It tends to be consumed where it's produced. You ever seen one of these vessels? Anybody? No? You have? Where? Oh, at the Persian Gulf. Oh, you fooled me. I didn't know you were there. What are you doing there? Fishing? That's a long ways to go fishing, Amir. Oh, did you? Okay. Well, we're going to have to talk about the price of oil. All right. Um, so here's a, a vessel that carries liquefied natural gas. So if we liquefy it, and we shrink it down by a factor of, it's, it's like five or 600 times. It's, don't look this up, yeah, okay? <laughs> we shrink it down by a factor of about 600 times, and then we can put it in a ship, and it's pretty stable, and we can export it to Japan or um, China, you know, wherever the, the market is. Um, but the natural gas market, the present time, um, we don't really have that opportunity. And there's a big debate in the United States because uh, there are a lot of US manufacturers, let's say especially the chemical companies and other manufacturers, who like the fact that natural gas in the US is uh, you know, a small uh, fraction of the price in Japan or the price in Europe. You know, so if it's, if it's $2.50 here and it's nine or ten dollars in Japan or Europe, that gives us a huge cost advantage in the production of a lot of products that use natural gas. So the, the chemical manufacturers are big, big consumers of natural gas, and they don't want us exporting natural gas. So they go to Congress and say, you know, don't allow these liquefaction plants, um, you know, this will undermine U.S. competitiveness, et cetera, et cetera. But there are some that are being built. I read about a large uh, facility down in Louisiana that's being constructed. And you can imagine when that gap was really large, you know, four or five years ago, right? There was a big gap between world and U.S. prices. Now, world prices have gone down quite a bit because oil's come down. But the U.S. price has gone down, but the gap has narrowed, hasn't it? So probably the, the profitability of building those facilities is not what it looked like a few years ago. But it takes a long time for them to come online, so they're, they're under construction. Um, so natural gas, as I said, I went to a conference last week, and the, the conference was sort of focused on uh, you know, the benefits of natural gas and the idea that we need to uh, be using more and more natural gas. Why is that? Well, um, yes, about BTUs, the price at the wellhead is, is pretty cheap compared to oil. So it's also a fossil fuel, but it's pretty inexpensive. But there are some, obviously, technological problems if we're going to start running all of our uh, large trucks on the road, these big semi-trucks. Some people want to have more and more of those trucks running on natural gas. Well, to do that, we need a set of retail stations where they can pull in and fill up. So we have to have liquefaction plants here or compression plants so they can fill up their trucks. Um, so that's uh, one option. Um, we're using them in some vehicles. I mentioned the buses around Davis. Some of you probably ride the bus. So you're being shuttled around by natural gas. And that works because those buses never leave town, right? So they come back to the facility at night. So that works pretty well. So why are they promoting natural gas? Well, it um, has a lower carbon footprint, right? So there's fewer CO2 emissions with natural gas per BTU. So they view it as being more environmentally friendly. But it was interesting. I told you that some individuals at the conference were saying, well, the, you know, the price of oil is soon going to come back up. And uh, so we'll be back in business. And there was one guy speaking there. His name was um, Emmanuel. And, and he, was, you know, he was promoting the use of natural gas in, 
in big trucks, so converting these diesel trucks. Diesel, lower carbon emissions than gasoline, but they spew out uh, uh, nitrogen oxide, which is bad for air quality pollution. So, uh, you know, you've read about the, the Volkswagen scandal, right? Actually, the guy who uncovered the Volkswagen scandal was there at the conference. It was pretty interesting. He was booked before this became news, and uh, he was a graduate student in West Virginia or somewhere, and his professor said, I want you to go out to California and uh, rent some European diesel cars and um, just go driving. I want you to drive from Los Angeles to Seattle and measure the emissions from the tailpipe. And he did that, and he couldn't believe what he found. It was like 30 times higher than what it should be. Um, and that's really what uncovered this whole scandal. So, you know, Volkswagen and other companies were telling, that, telling us that diesel is good because it has lower CO2 emissions. But the problem with diesel is it spews a lot of the, the NOx and nitrogen oxide and more CO2 than what Volkswagen was, was telling us, right? So these people are promoting natural gas. So this one guy, Emmanuel, was saying, um, you know, I really, I hope that, I'm just praying that the price of oil goes back to $100. And I, I just hope it goes back to 150 And the reason he's saying that is because he wants everybody to drive around in natural gas, right? And so I said, well, Emmanuel, I don't think I'm in that camp. I mean, the price of oil has fallen from $100 to $50, right? Uh, it's $50 a barrel. United States, anybody have any idea how much oil we use in a year? Apart from yen. 7 billion barrels, okay? So I multiply that by 50, it's $350 billion drop in cost of oil. U.S. population, 300 plus million, 320 million. So I said, Emmanuel, just work that out, man. It's, that's a thousand bucks a person, right? My family, that's $4,000 a year in consumer savings from the lower price of oil. So, you know, don't tell me you hope the price of oil is going back to 100 because that's a lot of money in uh, the pockets of consumers. So there are economic benefits from having a lower price of oil. And we have to measure those against carbon emissions, obviously. Um, but let's not say natural gas at any cost, right? Now, I can take my family to Hawaii for $4,000. So I'm happy with, with uh, oil at 50 bucks. Um, so it was uh, an interesting discussion. One more point on natural gas. Um, you see what's happened to the price here. I read this week that uh, UPS and FedEx, both successful companies, are raising their prices. And the justification is extra fuel surcharge. Well, you look at the UPS trucks, a lot of those run on natural gas because it's the same thing as our red buses. They come back to base at night. They're not traveling across the country. So they can run on natural gas. <clears throat> you know, look what's happened to the price of natural gas. And they're telling us they have to raise the price because of a fuel surcharge. Um, I'm thinking there's not enough, <coughs> excuse me, competition in that market. <coughs> excuse me. Yeah, go ahead, Ian. Yeah. Sure. This one or the ship? Yeah, so Yan is saying, how come this price went down and this price went up? Maybe we are sharing the same earth, right? Sharing what? Same earth, same planet. Yeah, we are. But you can't ship natural gas from uh, Louisiana to Japan unless you liquefy it. And we don't have the plants. So that's the answer is fracking. Remember the previous chart I showed how U.S. production went up? Okay. So that's why. 
there was a big surge in U.S. production through fracking that drove the, the U.S. price down and the Japanese price up. So you see that there was a time here when this was like $2, and that was almost 20. That's 10 to 1, right? And so that's when the U.S. manufacturers are saying, we love this. Um, you know, we have this huge cost advantage over Japan. So there, there are a lot of manufactured products where natural gas is a huge cost component, right? So you can imagine that price difference. And then that's when uh, some energy companies started looking at um, exporting natural gas. So, you know, lobbyists went to Congress saying, we can't export because that'll drive these prices back together. We lose our competitive advantage. But there are some plants being built. Chris? I don't know. Chris is asking is, can we blame Amazon for, so I don't, what are you thinking? How does that convert to a justification for additional fuel surcharge? Uh, I was just wondering, like, like, so does Amazon use FedEx in the US? Yeah. Is it yeah, I think so. Yeah. But anyway, look into that, and we can talk about it. I'm, I'm curious myself. You know, I just saw that. The headline, and I didn't really have time to dig into it. Yeah. For that question, like I think Amazon is still the problem of that product. Like, so like Amazon strategy is uh, they build their plant like uh, right next to like the USPS station. So like the okay. minimum minimize their cost. So okay. So cost of distribution. Yeah. It doesn't really cost that much. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess you're right. I mean, the, the, you're gonna run up a high fuel bill if you're delivering small packages to, you know, a lot of remote locations, but if you can cut that down somehow. Yes, Ben? This is natural gas factories. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's built to... You guys are like Emmanuel. You can't get off natural gas. It's, it's simple to ship. Um, yeah. Natural gas in Japan is in essence not a substitute for natural gas in the U.S. Correct. So why does the relative supply matter so much for price for remote workers? Why, I mean, so why does I what? Mm -hmm. Why does that affect the Japanese price? Uh, it, it doesn't have a direct impact. The, 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 the one common linkage here, you know, if, if, you looked at, if you look on LinkedIn, it tells you, okay, this friend has a mutual friend. So the mutual friend between Japanese natural gas and U.S. natural gas is crude oil. So they have a mutual friend, right? Crude oil has come down. That's pulled down the price of nat gas globally. It's pulled down the price of nat gas in the US. Fracking has also pushed it down in the US, but it's not the only reason. But then, it's just like, then why is Japanese natural gas, it's just coincidence that it peaked when the US went dropped, or is it like, is there a correlation there? Uh, I would say there's, obviously there's very little correlation between the US and the Japanese price, depending on time period. Um, but the Japanese price has more to do with the price of energy in global markets, essentially oil. Okay. What's your name in the back? Andrew. Andrew. Andrew, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, I heard you say that we have a better technology for fracking. What was this? Okay for producing natural gas and oil. Yeah, um, it depends. OK, I, I, I think that's true with fracking and oil. I guess it depends what country we're talking about. I mean, cost of production of oil is pretty low in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. OK, I think 90 is high for some of the OPEC countries. I haven't seen that number. I think for Saudi Arabia, it's much lower than that. Um, and as you know, um, one reason the price of oil has come down, Andrew, is that uh, when US production went up and you know we're, we're importing less, so we're not importing as much oil, say, from Nigeria or other countries, uh, there were some who anticipated that OPEC would reduce 
exports, right, to kind of push the price back up. And OPEC decided not to do that. They decided to keep, keep the oil flowing because they didn't want to lose market share. So they, they kept up their production and the price has been driven down. There's some uh, belief that what they're, they're not trying to drive out U.S. fracking because, as you said, that cost of production is pretty low and it's actually gone down in the last couple of years as technology has improved. But there's some belief that they're trying to drive out the oil from the tar sands in Canada. There's a huge supply of oil uh, in Canada, in Alberta, which is where I came from. Uh, where did Amir go? He disappeared on me. Um, so, I mean, who knows? But that's, that's kind of what's going on in terms of that global oil market. But it's an interesting question, and we, we should probably look at those different costs of production, but you're right, they vary dramatically. Yosef. Yeah. Hard for the U.S. to export, but there are uh, probably, I don't know, 20% of the natural gas consumed globally is imported. So places like Qatar do. I'm sorry if I suggested it, it can be it can be done. You saw those ships, right? We, we don't do it here because the the production increase is relatively new, and it's very expensive to build those liquefaction plants. But that's why. Amir has seen those ships, right? He, he comes from a part of the world where they do it. Okay, I'll see you on Thursday. <laughs>